planet was born in violence and grew with disaster. Four billion years ago, primitive life may have been drifting in the oceans, but disaster loomed. The seas were lost to intense heat, yet science tells us life survived. Deep underground, it waited for the oceans to return. Life's goal is to survive, no matter what. And survive it did, first through fire and then through ice on a miracle planet. Today, New York is a thriving cosmopolitan city, one of the great cities on Earth. Yet 20,000 years ago, this whole area was covered by vast sheets of ice. Glaciers ground their way through Central Park. Large rocks that have no right to be here. It's as if they were dropped erratically by some mythical giant. Before geology was a science, it was recognized that they were from another place. Some thought they were the debris carried by the waters of Noah's flood. They were carried by water, but not liquid water. Ice. To the north, Greenland is still a country of ice. Large rocks locked in glaciers are slowly transported away from where they were originally formed. Glaciers move very slowly. Their forward motion can be measured in years rather than in distance. But when the ice melts, the cargo it carries is dropped. Geologists call these rocks erratics or drop stones. For science, they are important pieces of evidence. They give clues to the evolution of life. Erratics are found across the globe, and they are proof as to which parts of the Earth were once covered by ice. 20,000 years ago, some parts of the world were locked in ice. In Canada, near Lake Huron, there is evidence of a far earlier ice age, when the entire globe may have been frozen. Mike Hailston, a district geologist with Canada's Ministry of Northern Development and Mines, knows where to find rocks that predate the last ice age by billions of years. This is the one that I wanted to show you. It's an Archean granite boulder stuck in a rock that's 2.4 billion years old. It's a diamictite formed from a glacial action that occurred 2.4 billion years ago. Throughout the region, there are rocks and gravel sediments that really have no place in local geology. They are all between 2.2 and 2.4 billion years old. Older rocks are found in younger strata, as if the Earth has constantly recycled its crust. The rocks have been moved by continental drift, as well as by glaciers. To try and locate where they originally came from takes us back into the past. Glacial sediments over two billion years old have been found in at least seven different parts of the globe. Until fairly recently, trying to pinpoint where they came from has been purely educated guesswork. Namibia in southern Africa is an ancient landscape carved by wind and erosion. But glacial sediments also show that ice once played a major role. Now hot and dusty as well as isolated, it is a hard country to work in. For geologists, though, 
it can be a paradise. Dr. Joseph Kirschwink is from the California Institute of Technology. His specialty is magnetics. The Earth is surrounded by magnetism produced by its own magnetic field, the way compasses work. Long ago, as they formed on the Earth's surface, the jagged rocks in this riverbed were molten lava. We are sitting on some lavas that erupted 2.2 billion years ago during a time of a very large glaciation. It's very nice because when the lavas cool, they preserve the direction of the magnetic field, and from that we can measure the latitude. Molten lava contains many minerals which are magnetized. As the lava flows, these minerals follow the magnetic force of the Earth. Once it cools, the magnetic direction of that moment is fixed forever. It is then possible to locate exactly where the rock was formed. To do this, one matches the magnetic history of the rock with the angle of the lines of geomagnetic force that surround the planet. Once that has been determined, the latitude can be fixed. At the center of the screen is the pole. The further away a point is from the center, the closer it is to the equator. When the samples from Namibia were analyzed, their magnetic compasses pointed to the fact that they all had originated near the equatorial regions, closer to the equator than Hawaii and Guam are today. This confirms that over two billion years ago, there were glaciers near the equator. To have glaciers there at that latitude implies that it has to be colder as you go north. Hence, the entire Earth, right down to the equator, had to have been frozen. Not once, but twice. For glacial sediments in strata dated between 800 to 600 million years ago. With this data, Dr. Kirschwink put forward the proposal that the Earth had been completely covered in ice at least twice in its history. It was called the Snowball Earth, and like many scientific theories, this one is hotly debated. Okay, now, Children always now enjoy scrambling around back. looking for rocks. Hold it close to your eyes. That means you gotta go right down on the rock. This was and there are few better rock. teachers than Dr. Paul Hoffman of Harvard University. For years now, his passion has been geology, and he is also a keen advocate for snowball earth. The impact of the snowball events would, of course, be much more severe because uh, organisms might try to escape towards the tropics, but <clears throat> eventually in the oceans, the ice will completely envelop the tropics because this ice is flowing. It will move into the tropics and meet at the equator. Working with scientists at the University of Tokyo, a computer simulation was carried out to show what would happen to today's world if a snowball Earth event were to occur. At 35 degrees north, Tokyo is just a little further south than New York. Ice up to 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet thick would bury the city. At first, any life that could not find shelter would freeze to death. At the start, the glaciers would move slowly. It would 
take millions of years for the ice to reach a latitude where Hawaii and Cuba are. But from there to the equator would take only a few decades. Hoffman thinks that the sea might freeze down to a depth of over half a mile. Some life might escape under the ice, but only for a while, for sunlight would be cut off and the base of the food chain would die. It would seem as if the world would become a dead planet. But life is present on the Earth today, so where could it have taken refuge? And an even more extensive and we think very interesting place where life would have survived would be in cracks that would always develop because the sea ice is flowing whereas the ice that is at the coast would be frozen and locked in place. And therefore, there will always be a shear between the glaciers flowing in the ocean and the land fast ice. And so cracks will continually open and then freeze and then open and freeze and open and freeze. And there's a very rich biota that lives in cracks and in channels of salty water that get enclosed within new sea ice. How a snowball event gets started is still not fully understood. But strangely, it may have something to do with the gases which keep the Earth warm. Moderate levels of carbon dioxide help to keep the planet warm. But there is evidence which suggests that prior to the first snowball event, these levels were far lower. If so, what kept the planet warm? A large area of wetlands and swamp in the southeast of the United States can give some clues to the makeup of Earth's early atmosphere. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge covers an area of 400,000 acres. The shallow, warm water is sometimes only knee-deep. Beneath the surface, the swamp floor is soft and spongy. Now, right here is the Loblolly Bay. Is this tree in front of it? Don Berryhill was a science teacher. Now, as a volunteer guide, he enjoys sharing both his love for the area as well as his love for science. See where I'm digging down here? Look what's coming out. All right, that's a gas that's produced by the bacteria and the fungi down there. As soon as the bottom of the swamp is disturbed, gas bubbles escape. Now, that's the purpose of having it on a stick so we can get it. No, not yet. We're losing our gas. It is a highly flammable gas called oh, methane. Right, that was there, you're good. You got it. All right. This gas is sometimes used in households for cooking. But here it is produced by microbial life there it is. called methanogenes. Ah, Ta-da! <laughs> That's a ta-da! <laughs> Unlike so much life on the planet today, methanogenes don't rely on sunlight for energy. Instead, they get their energy by breaking down nutrients and making methane as a waste gas. Scientists believe that methane was the greenhouse gas which kept the early Earth warm. As methane bubbles to the surface, we now know that climate change is nothing new. And is a specialty for Dr. Jim Casting of Pennsylvania State University, who is a leading researcher in atmospherics. 